On May 5th, the pickets and skirmishers of both sides knocked into one another along the Orange Fredericksburg Turnpike. These forces, the leading elements of Warren's 5th Corps and portions of other commands, probed up the road and would find that their path was blocked. The 2nd Corps, under Ewell, was closest to Grant's push southward, still holding some of its defenses until Warren was discovered turning his flank from the Rapidan River crossing at Germana Ford. Ewell then moved his men by the right flank into the path of Warren's veteran 5th Corps. One soldier, Sergeant John Worsham of the 21st Virginia Infantry, was in the front lines of this confrontation. He wrote of this initial fight. All knew that Grant had crossed the Rapidan and soon the tumult of battle would begin. The march continued and command, close up, soon the order. Halt, load your guns, and then shoulder, arms, march. Soon the battle line was formed. We broke the enemy's line in front and made no halt in our advance. On we went shooting as fast as we could load. Suddenly I was confronted by a gun resting on a big stump and behind the stump we saw a yank. We hallooed to him to lay down his gun. Several of us took aim at him. He, he started to rise, but before he could do so, a little crack of the gun and the yank fell dead. We advanced to a dense pine thicket and halted, every man falling flat on the ground at once for protection. The men could not see very much of the enemy, and the fighting got close. And because of this, melees erupted everywhere. Volleys were shot in the direction of the enemy musket flashes and there was generally much confusion. One soldier of the Vermont Brigade, Sergeant Nelson Cole, wrote of this clash. We went by flank into line on the double quick, but did not get into line before they fired a volley into us. There was not over 150 yards away. This volley thinned our ranks in a fearful manner. Captain Wales, my captain, was seriously wounded. He was shot through the lung. About that time we had orders to fall back and the enemy opened another volley, but we got him out all right. A shot went through my blouse pocket and tore a bunch of cartridges to pieces and another went through my pants leg, but they did not draw blood. We cut a slash and built breastworks and lay behind them until the next day the pickets were driven in. The Rebs advanced in three lines. When the first line got through the slack, we gave them another which stopped them. The dead and dying were in every shape. We then charged and brought in a lot of prisoners. They fell back and we formed a new line of pickets. The loss in the Vermont Brigade was staggering, but they bought the Army time, and eventually the Second Corps came up and held the line. The Second Corps and Hill's Confederate Third Corps would then begin a fight that was a tangled mess. Getty's 6th Corps Division and then elements of Hancock's men attacked Hill's lines. The Confederate Division of Henry Heath and then troops under Brigadier General Cadmus Wilcox did some superb fighting through the darkness, holding their ground, a tenuous hold. On the morning of May 6th, the fighting along both lines would become general as all the troops arrived in the field. With the Federal 5th Corps holding the right flank, supported by elements of the 6th, Burnside's 9th engaged in the center, playing on A.P. Hill's flank and rear, and Hancock's stalwarts held the left against Hill. Lee seemed to be tearfully jubilant, and as he rode amongst the famed Texas Brigade, he intended on going forward into the attack with them. The soldiers started calling out to him, Lee to the rear, Lee to the rear. Lee seeing that he was slowing their advance, complied with their demands, and the Texans, along with other veteran troops of Longstreet's Corps, plunged into Hancock's Second Corps. One of the last actions on May 6th was Brigadier General John Gordon's attack on the right flank of the Federal Army, which pounced on some elements of the Sixth Corps there, rolling them up and capturing two Union generals. This almost caused a panic amongst the men at Grant's headquarters. Grant told them to stop worrying about what Lee would do and keep focused on what they would do to fight him. 
It was a telling moment, as Grant was not Hooker and was in no way intimidated by Lee, as the rest of the campaign would show. Perhaps Grant would be outgeneraled on a few occasions, but he was never scared of Lee. By the morning of the 8th, the Army of the Potomac was put in motion. Meade and Grant were surely frustrated by the jumbled mass of confusion in the forests. Lee had bested Grant on the first meeting, the Army of the Potomac sustaining over 17,000 casualties, and the Army of Northern Virginia lost somewhere between 8,000 and 11,000 men. The race would soon begin for the rolling hill country towards Spotsylvania Courthouse. Due to some great engineering and cavalry usage, Lee's men won the race and would force Grant to attack at the Battle of Spotsylvania. It was known and promoted that Grant made a declaration that the press loved. U.S. Grant stated that he intended on fighting it out on this line if it takes all summer in this upcoming battle. Grant was absolutely locking horns with Lee, and he would in fact not let up the pressure. Nowhere would that fighting be more brutal and ghastly than at Spotsylvania. Lee's veterans had fought a major engagement, held back the big army of the Potomac, and within days, they were finding themselves beginning another slaughter. This fight would begin on May 8th, when troops under General Richard Anderson, Longstreet's replacement, relieved the hard-pressed cavalry from a blocking position. They threw up their works and took on troops of Warren's 5th Corps and Sedgwick's 6th Corps at Laurel Hill with the Spindle Farm between the lines, bearing mute testimony to the carnage that renewed itself soon after the wilderness. Wave after wave of Union infantry hurled themselves against Anderson and were cut down to the point that officers and men had to consider mutiny if asked to try it another time. It was at this location that the beloved Uncle John Sedgwick, commander of the 6th Corps, was hit by a Confederate sharpshooter early on the 9th. His men had little time to mourn his loss and they were soon up against more Confederate defenses. Before more action could be thrown against the troops of Anderson, Ewell came around and occupied Anderson's right flank, continuing the line and immediately digging in. This line would be continued on the 9th, and both sides brought up the remainder of their armies. Lee was allowing his army to dig in and take on the assaults of the Army of the Potomac, and Meade and Grant had him stationary as they had wanted when the campaign began. But Lee's men were getting efficient at erecting fortifications overnight and by the 10th were solidly in line around the McCool and Harrison houses. Among the 6th Corps was a veteran officer, Colonel Emery Upton, a regular army officer who had commanded the 121st New York Infantry and a brigade. His plan was a deep formation of several lines that could sweep over the works of the Confederates and turn up and down the lines, opening a breach for others to exploit. Grant liked the idea and allowed 12 picked regiments to be a part of it. The command went in three regiments across and four regiments deep. It was an impressive formation. One New Yorker, Corporal Clinton Beckwith of Upton's regiment, wrote of the attack. We were ordered to fix bayonets, to load and cap our guns, and to charge at right shoulder shift arms. No man was to stop and succor or assist a wounded comrade. We must go as far as possible, and when we broke their line, face to our right, advance and fire lengthwise of their line. Colonel Upton was with our regiment and rode on our right. He instructed us not to fire a shot, cheer, or yell until we struck their works. It was nearly sundown when we were ready to go forward. The officers were shouting forward and breaking into a run immediately after we got into the field a short distance. As soon as we began to run, the men, unmindful of our forgetting orders, commenced to yell. And in a few steps farther, the rifle pits were dyed with puffs of smoke. And the men began to fall rapidly and some began to fire at the works, thus losing the chance they had to do something when they reached the works to protect themselves. We were broken up some getting through the slashing and abatee by this time, the rebels were beginning to fire a second time, and rapid but scattering fire along the works, which were reached in another instant. 
one of our officers in front of us jumped on the top log and shouted, Come on, men! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! And pitched forward and disappeared. Shot. As I got up on top, some Rebs jumped up from their side and began to run back. Some were lunging at our men with their bayonets, and a few had their guns clubbed. Jim Johnson, Oakes, and Hassett were wounded by bayonets. Upton's assault broke the Confederate lines for about a quarter of a mile. The attack was staggered by severe counterattacks, but not before Upton pulled off with several hundred prisoners. For his efforts, Grant promoted Upton to Brigadier General. The attack was successful in demonstrating that an attack in depth could not be stopped as it had too much momentum. And the Federal Army would become the masters of this tactic with their clear advantage in numbers. This organized style of Upton's was respected by Grant who devoted to further attack this mule shoe with even more men. Through May 11th, Grant and Meade prepared for an attack on the center of the Mule Shoe Line. Hancock's men were ready and assembled, with elements of the 5th, 6th, and 9th Corps to assist on left and right flanks of Hancock's supposed breach of the lines. The attack was planned for the pre-dawn hour of May 12th, and approximately 15,000 men were led through the misty, damp morning towards the Confederate salient. Within a few hundred yards, the Confederate skirmishers fired, and then the mighty roar of all those Federal soldiers provided a constant cheer of hurrah, hurrah. Up and over the works they went. Thousands of Confederates were captured, generals and all. It happened in the space of minutes. Brigade after brigade of Confederate troops were thrown into the breach. General Lee, near the McCool House behind the breakthrough, was attempting to lead one of these counterattacks, and again had to be discouraged by calls of Lee to the rear. The Confederate troops drove much of the Federal columns back to the works. No troops fought harder or accomplished more to keep the Yankees at bay than McGowan's South Carolina Brigade and Harris's Mississippi Brigade. One Mississippi soldier, David Holt, of the 16th Mississippi Infantry wrote of the carnage at the mule shoe as the fighting entered its several hour mark. And the ongoing rain just added misery to the efforts of the soldiers. The breastwork was in a bog and to make a charge in such a place against a line of fierce men close up who would have no idea of giving way was more than these gallant Yankees could do. Many of them were shot dead and sank down on the breastworks without pulling their feet out of the mud. Many others plunged forward when they were shot and fell headlong into the trench among us. Between the charges we cleared the trench of the dead and wounded and loaded all the guns we could get a hold of for the next charge. I was shooting seven guns myself. We stacked them up against the breastworks with the butts in the trench. When the Yanks came, we picked them up one by one, fired them and set them down again. The blood shed by the dead and wounded in the trench mixed with the mud and the water it became more than shoe deep was smeared all over our clothes. The attacks ran out of steam and once again Lee had held his positions, though he lost many good officers and men, especially the approximately 3,000 men who were captured there. It was carnage as never seen by even the most rugged veteran on either side, with men from both sides rescuing wounded from either army. They were drowning in the water and the blood-filled ditches. It was ghastly. But all the way into the night of the 12th, the shooting continued. By 4 a.m. on the morning of the 13th, the Mule Shoe Salient was evacuated and Confederates wearily pulled back to a new fortified position on the high ground beyond the Harrison Farm. It was almost 24 hours of continuous fighting on one line, not soon forgotten by those veterans who were there. The Army of the Potomac was stopped in their attempt to place a crushing blow against the Army of Northern Virginia. This situation was one that would normally have the Army of the Potomac retreat, encamp, and figure out a new strategy, perhaps even changing the command of the Army. But Grant was different, as he would continue to attempt to get between Lee and Richmond and force Lee's army to attack. The men in blue saw that Grant continued on 
and despite the losses, they were elated that they would continue the fighting. The Battle of Spotsylvania resulted in approximately 18,000 federal casualties and 12,000 Confederate casualties. The sum losses for Grant so far in his campaign were over 35,000 men, or approximately one-third of his army. But he could and would replace those men, whereas Lee could not. Grant was in fact winning the war in this methodology, though tactically losing to Lee in these fortified battles. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.